Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome, uh, a warm welcome to this Bateman Chambers property webinar on commercial rents and restructuring after Virgin Active uh, navigating the way out of COVID-19. Uh, as you'll have seen, I hope, we've identified four broad issues for consideration by our eminent panel, who you can see on screen, uh, whom I'll introduce in a moment. During the seminar, please feel free to ask any questions via the chat function, uh, but please be assured we will be only us, only we on the panel will be able to see the questions that have been asked. Um, by way of initial introduction, uh, I offer briefly uh, the following. Uh, a basic introduction um, to the, sec uh, the Part 26A uh, restructuring with which Virgin Active was concerned. And secondly, a, a brief reminder of some of the issues uh, that have um, been coming up or have come up in recent times in the context of the issues that we've identified. Um, so welcome to the cinema seminar. You are in the right place or, or maybe not. Um, can I first of all deal with um, section uh, part 26A uh, of the Companies Act, which uh, essentially in the context of Virgin uh, involves sections 901A to G uh, of the Act. And probably the most important principal point to know to start with is that 26A, unlike, unlike 26, uh, involves a cross-class cram down, which means that um, classes of creditors and dissent can still be folded into uh, a restructuring plan, uh, unlike, unlike in a traditional Part 26 application. There are three parts to an application. Uh, the first is um, the court ordered convention of the creditors. Uh, and in the Virgin Active case, that was the senior secured lenders, the landlords and the general property creditors. Um, there's then a meeting of the classes of creditors having been convened. And then there's a further hearing at which the uh, court sanctions or not the restructuring plan. Where there's dissent at the sanction hearing, the third hearing, section, uh, section 901G deals with uh, that. Uh, and the um, company needs to satisfy the court of two things. First of all, condition A, none of the members of the dissenting class will be any worse off than they would be in the event of a relevant alternative, which in Virgin Active was called the no worse off test. Uh, and condition B, the compromise or agreement had been agreed by a number representing 75% in value of a class of creditors, or as may be of members, who would receive payment or have a genuine economic interest in the company. Uh, and then uh, lastly, the sanctioning of the uh, plan needs to be um, an appropriate exercise of the court's discretion. Two initial points to note about uh, the Virgin Active case. First of all, the, relative, the relevant alternative was determined to be uh, a trading admin and the accelerated sale of regional business. And that was determined by reference to issues of valuation, which we may mention later on. And condition B was also satisfied because the votes in favour had come from the secured creditors and class A landlords. So um, the judge, Mr Justice Snowden, was only concerned essentially uh, with the no worse off test and the question of discretion. Um, we're also going to look at com company voluntary arrangements. You'll be well familiar with the provisions of Section 1 of the Insolvency Act, which provides for the um, setting up a voluntary arrangement uh, as approved under Section 4A and then uh, gives rise or provides for a challenge to a CVA under Section 6, uh, essentially um, material irregularity or unfair prejudice. And um, just by way of reminder, there are three principal CVA challenge cases with which um, uh, in recent times um, issues have arisen. The first is the Debenhams decision, Mr. Justice Norris, 2019. The second is New Look, um, where again, um, we, uh, Mr. Justice Zaccaroli uh, has given permission to appeal on five grounds. Uh, firstly, the jurisdiction ground, i.e. is it right for a VA to give, uh, provide for different deals as between different uh, classes of creditors? S secondly, was it sufficient give and take as between the company and the various compromised creditors, and in that case, the note holders? Is it fair or unfair, fairly prejudicial to permit vote swamping by self-interested creditors by way of discount um, to uh, being applied to the value of claims of compromised creditors, mostly landlords. Uh, and lastly, um, whether or not the inclusion of future rent is fair, given that is for the benefit of the entirety of the creditors. Uh, and the third decision, as again, I'm sure you're aware, is the Regis decision, which was handed down uh, by Mr. Justice Zaccaroli just after or within a week, I think, of new look. Um, on the commercial rent recovery side, 
there are two decisions um, to note, uh, again, in, in recent months. The first, Comet's Real Investment Gazelle Shaft versus TFS, uh, about a unit in uh, Westfield. That was March to March, 16th of April. Uh, and then secondly, uh, coming along uh, about five days later, a decision again of a master, the Bank of New York Mellon International case against Cine UK, Mecca and Sports Direct. And I think another party that wasn't directly involved in the hearing. Um, and the main issues on those cases um, were essentially was summary judgment appropriate, whether arguments in relation to rent cessor, did availability of insurance cut across the giving a judgment in respect of rent arrears, did frustration provide an opportunity for the tenants to argue that the arrear, that the leases had been uh, frustrated uh, or terminated. Uh, and lastly, um, in the context of commercial, uh, the commercial realities and what's going to happen in the future, we will, I think, hopefully touch on Section 82 of the 2020 Act. Um, the, you'll remember, of course, that Schedule 10 and Section 10 of the Corporate Insolvency Governance Act, Governance Act restricts stat demands, stat demands and petitions um, in the case of petitions where the uh, petitioner can't demonstrate a reasonable belief that the debt is not based or caused by coronavirus restrictions. Um, you would have seen probably yesterday that the government has announced that the moratorium on evictions is to be extended on the 25th of uh, March 2022. And we think, we're trying to divine, uh, look at the uh, tea leaves winding up until the 1st of October. And there is also now a confirmation of this binding arbitration process in relation to commercial rent arrears. And we, will see, uh, we may have a chance to discuss that and see how that might work. Um, penultimately, the CRA regulations are also um, being restricted. So that again, essentially six quarters rent needs to be outstanding. Um, and that will remain the case, I think, until the 25th of March date. Uh, and last and probably least, um, we may have cause to discuss briefly the code of practice for commercial property relationships during, during COVID-19, um, we shall see. So uh, with that introduction, to help us consider some of those issues as time allows, I'm delighted to introduce um, our distinguished panel this morning. Uh, first of all, we're honored to be uh, joined by James Archibald, who's Group Legal Director of Virgin Active, um, who has, uh, was and is deeply involved in the restructuring uh, and the commercial issues that um, are falling out of that for the business. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, three of my very distinguished colleagues, first of all, Philomena Harrison, uh, a property junior of vast experience, who's recently been praised for her fantastic combination of brilliance and practical application. She was counsel for Cineworld um, in the rent arrears case I identified a moment ago. Secondly, Tim Calland, another supremely gifted barrister who, among other things, is described as being someone you always want in your corner. And he was counsel for Mecca Bingo in the second rent arrears case. And last, but very, much, but very much not least, Alec McCluskey, uh, who's been described as a very, very classy performer and amazing. Uh, and he was counsel for one of the general property creditors in the Virgin Active Restructuring. So with that introduction, James, uh, over to you. Um, and we start with the journey to the restructuring plan. Yeah, I'll just um, give, you a, give you a brief overview of how we ended up. Um, in the position we did in, um, in March of this year, launching the restructuring plan. So in common with um, you know, all, all other leisure and retail uh, and hospitality businesses, we were you know, absolutely hit for six by, um, by the first lockdown in, in March of last year. Um, and obviously the disruption continued through the year. We were able to open up our clubs in the UK again in um, July. We, our, our business, um, Operates in uh, a number of uh, nations, a number of countries. So we have we have a similar sized business in uh, Italy. We also have clubs in Australia, Singapore, and Thailand, um, as well as a, a separate business in South Africa, which which actually wasn't sort of part of these arrangements, as it's um, in a separate um, a separate sort of banking group and a separate a separate part of the um, part of the business, but also was, has been similarly impacted. But all of our clubs in um, all territories were, you know, were closed by um, by some point in April last year and remained closed for varying amounts of times. So, yeah, during for 2020, we lost um, we lost about half of our revenue versus 2019. Yeah, when the clubs are closed, the memberships were frozen. Um, we're not collecting any 
you know, we, we don't have another source of revenue. And so we're like a, you know, we're, we're like a restaurant or a cinema that's just, you know, shut. It's not, not like retail. We've got, we've not got other channels, digital or um, uh, sort of remote channels that we can generate revenue through really. So the, the impact of, um, of the pandemic on us has been um, you know, dramatic and, and sudden. Um, so that, that 50% revenue drop equates to um, about 200 million um, pounds sterling. The, um, by the point we'd launched the restructuring plan, the UK business had been closed for nine of the previous 12 months and um, Italy uh, near the same and, and both were both were closed um, as, uh, as, as we launched still. The, obviously during 2020, we did, you know, we did, as everyone else did, lots of things. We, you know, we accessed the furlough scheme to get as much government support as we could. We took um, the opportunity to defer taxes as, as was um, made available. Um, you know, staff took pay cuts. You know, we, we restructured our business. We um, cut off some of our um, properties that were, you know, that we, we wanted to, you know, so we, we were able to let go or surrender and, you know, kind of uh, reduce our exposure there. Um, and we also raised in 2020, 50 million of liquidity from our shareholders and our banks um, to, to, we thought, see us through um, to the other side of the pandemic. Um, and then we reopened in uh, July and, um, you know, began trading, not terribly successfully. Um, obviously, you um, City was a suppressed, uh, suppressed zone, if you like, or you know, people not returning to work uh, in the city, um, which is where you know a large part of our business is, um, and so we just you know revenue didn't didn't recover, um, and then in the post uh, July period we were negotiating with our landlords um, in particular to try to agree uh, sort of rent concessions and uh, other other arrangements with them to. You know, give us give us breathing space give us the liquidity um support that we needed to to we hope to see ourselves through to um positive trading um, and then everything changed again with the lockdowns in um well sort of the partial lockdowns that began in november in the uk um also italy went back into lockdown in october and then uh, december and january national lockdowns in the in the uk you know really kind of put paid to any ideas of uh, a trading recovery for, for us and I'm sure for, for many others. Um, and so, you know, clubs went back into closure, revenue stopped again, and we had to, you know, we had to um, consider what options were available to us, how we, how we would um, either save the business or um, if we couldn't save the business, you know, get best value for, for creditors. So that, yeah, that took us through to, um, yeah, early part of early part of 2021, and you know, so that at that point we started looking seriously at a restructuring plan as a as an option. So, what sort of shape were you at that point looking at the restructuring plan being? Um, well, we knew it had to involve you know a number of a number of different creditor groups. Um, our secured creditors crucially needed to uh, needed to um, sort of be part of the arrangements. We had. Um, our, our maturities, our senior debt um, facilities were maturing in June 2022. We weren't going to, there was no prospect of us um, repaying those facilities in, in June 2022 as uh, things were looking in January of this year. Um, so, uh, and we saw no, pro we saw no reasonable prospect of, uh, of getting new lenders in to refinance those, those facilities. So we needed to extend the maturity of our facilities and also ideally um, you know, stop the cash outflow on those in terms of interest, the capitalised interest, that kind of that kind of thing. We also needed, you know, waivers of things that would become events of default if uh, if if they weren't if they weren't um, sort of waived in advance. Um, we also we didn't have the support of all of our banks at this stage either or at any stage. So the the, the changes that we needed to the um, facilities uh, would have required hundred percent. Uh, lender consent under the terms of the banking docs. So we needed a we needed a restructuring tool that would enable us to get those changes um, without having 100% consent. Um, the other the other key group were was landlords. Um, you know we have a, you know a big built up of you know a big arrears position with landlords, and you know a very big rent roll going forwards as well. 
Um, so that that needed to be addressed. We'd had discussions with landlords. We've been negotiating through um, second half of in particular of 2020, but with you know with limited se- success in the in the UK. Um, so those yeah those creditors needed to be wrapped up in the restructuring plan. We also had um, a whole bunch of guarantees of clubs that we had sold to other operators in the past that we were still on the hook for should those operators fail. So, you know, given everybody was in the same situation as us in the sector and not generating revenue, yeah, that became a, yeah, that was a very real risk of um, those guarantee claims coming back and, you know, undermining anything that, that we were doing on our on our trading estate. Um, and we also needed our, you know, we needed further support from our shareholders and from our uh, licensed store Virgin um, to, to see us through because the, you know, we knew what we, what we thought we could get from landlords um, in any in any restructuring was not going to be sufficient to um, to bridge the liquidity gap that we we were looking at, which was going to be a sort of a, a, a more than hundred million uh, liquidity gap uh, by by about this time next um, uh, in two years time. So it was a you know, kind of a worsening gap, um, but uh, we knew that we couldn't fix it. Um, through landlords alone, so shareholders um, would, you know, definite with, you know, the balancing, the balancing item room. Really. Now, Alec, you were for a general property creditor. First of all, um, what was a general? Is a general property creditor? Uh, so, a sweep up class, really, of someone who's not a landlord but has uh, some sort of liability related to property. So, I was for a uh, a manager who'd been appointed by a tribunal over one of the uh, sites where Virgin has a gym. Right. Uh, and what was the position that you took in advance of or uh, at the hearing? I think you were only at the convening hearing, but not the sanctions. Is that right? That, that's right. Uh, we, yeah. we were, uh, I- I- in essence, trying to persuade the court to move us from the class of general property creditors uh, to a different class uh, it, with a view to improving our position, uh, which is one of the one of the sort of classic debates that you might get at a convening hearing. Right. And what was your greatest concern in, in advance of that hearing, would you say, your client's greatest concern? Well, we had we had a number of concerns. I mean, obviously, we were looking to improve our position. But uh, uh, another issue that had arisen, which I think was novel, uh, was that the estate where the gym was located uh, wasn't just let to commercial tenants. Uh, it also had a large number of residential leaseholders mm. and uh, we were concerned that indirectly uh, those residential leaseholders might end up being uh, impacted uh, by the restructuring plan essentially by being uh, left on the hook for a greater share of uh, utilities um, mm. w- which ought to have been paid for uh, by uh, one of the commercial tenants virgin but wouldn't be paid for as a result of the restructuring plan so we were interested in the impact on uh you know third parties with no commercial relationship with virgin uh, and uh, we were seeking to seeking to address that which we um w- we managed to do and some changes were made in fact to the plan uh, in the re- right in the world. That's, that's interesting. So the, at the convening hearing, as a, con, as a consequence, only the convening hearing, you achieved your objective without any need to go to forward to the sanction hearing. We did. Yes. Yeah. And, and um, add, just briefly. Yeah. Sorry, James. So I was just going to say, as you know, as a consequence, the yeah, you know, the, the issues that um, uh, Alec and his his clients raised were ones that we hadn't we hadn't foreseen. It was rather an indirect um, indemnity mm-hmm. arrangement that would have enabled the manager to seek indemnification from. You know, other commercial tenants, but also residential tenants, as, as Alec explained, for service charges that would be compromised um, under our under our restructuring plan. Yeah, you know, we didn't. You know, we we had no interest in pushing those costs on to um, residential tenants. So we agreed to, um, insofar as the indemnity you know, arrangements might apply, we agreed to exclude um, you know exclude those commercial uh, those residential tenants from our uh, from our plan to make it clear that you know it. If they had a cause of action against us, we weren't trying to um, we weren't trying to stop that um, happening. And then Alec actually and his clients went to um, went to the tribunal and got some clarifying um, decisions from the from the tribunal about how that um, indemnity worked or who who should be liable for the service charge. 
you, you can see that more generally, this is something, uh, as plans become more popular and widespread, this sort of thing may well crop up again. Unexpected uh, consequences of plans for people who aren't in any sort of commercial relationship <laughs> with the plan companies. Uh, and no doubt we'll, it, it, we'll get more law on that as, uh, as plans become more widespread. Mm. And James, were, were those sorts of tweaks, or sort of tweaks that you agreed with Alex Clyde? Was that something that was uh, necessary or, or common with other creditors or, or smallish creditors or general property creditors? Uh, it, no, it, it, it wasn't common, actually. It was, um, I think, right. um, it was only Alex client that we, we had that particular issue with and that we sought to address. So we, um, you know, there, there was a relatively small group of, uh, you know, general property creditors in the sweep up class that, um, that Alex refers to. Um, and it was, yeah, this was the only one where we needed to uh, kind of make tweaks for, for unexpected sort of impacts. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it really, um, you know, it, it, it affected those general property creditors kind of as, as intended. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll no, come back to you. That's the question. You're gone. Yeah, do um, sorry, of course. Um, to no. James Archibald, um, how, how did you come up with the plan? Was it was it something that you, you within the business, you had a clear idea what you wanted to do, or, or did you go to professional advisors and just say, help design something for us? How did it well, work? Yeah, I mean, a bit of, a bit of both. We, I mean, we knew we needed help. We'd got Deloitte um, engaged last year, helping us to look at our potential options after, you know, kind of in the in the um, sort of latter half of last year, when we really weren't we, so we weren't getting where we needed to on consensual negotiations to look at what options were available to us. I mean, the main thing we were looking at at the time was, you know, CVA is the CVA feasible? Will the CVA achieve what we what we want to do? Um, it, it actually wasn't until. January that we began seriously looking at the restructuring plan as a as a route um, largely because we wanted to we thought it'd be better to stay on sort of tried and tested ground although CVAs are obviously contentious and you know kind of sort of, sort of institutional challenges um, is, is pretty much routine it seems in CVAs now but yeah we didn't particularly want to be trailblazers um, you know, Virgin Atlantic, which is, you know, obviously has a Virgin um, ownership interest in it, but, you know, it's sort of separate from our separate separate shareholders, separate majority shareholders, um, had done a restructuring plan, but for a very different business. Um, you know, we knew that a restructuring plan would be sort of complicated and involved and thought a CVA was probably better suited to, uh, um, to our circumstances. Um, but the yeah, that, that sort of advice and that view changed in January, particularly as we realised we didn't have the, crucially, the support of all our secured lenders, um, which really ruled a CVA out because a CVA won't bind secured creditors unless they, you know, unless they agree to it, um, which they, you know, which, which they wouldn't in our case. So we needed something that would um, bind secured creditors, which, you know, gave us the restructuring plan. Um, and the alternative, the two, the two live alternatives in January were, were restructuring plan or trading administration. Um, it was the one, one or the other. Prepack administration didn't seem to be really viable either um, for, for us. I mean, you know, who's going to buy a prepacked um, gym business in the middle of a pandemic apart from anything else? Um, so, yeah, that, and there wasn't an obvious, you know, there wasn't, wasn't an obvious buyer. Um, so... Yeah, we arrived at restructuring plan, not not as a, you know, we weren't sort of hell bent on restructuring plan. We kind of ended up at restructuring plan, really. So, James, once you decided that that was the way you were going to go forward, how long did the process take? Um, it took it, it took about, um, I say, was about probably four months to get to implementation from kind of decision. So middle of January or late late January well middle of January as sort of company advisors we kind of reached the conclusion we needed to to run a re, you know, restructuring plan look like the um the solution we then had to go to our shareholders and our banks to try and get their support for that we weren't at all sure that the banks would support um but um that was yeah we did that at the end of end of January beginning of February and then um by middle of February or sort of middle to, to late February, we'd really got the um, banks and the shareholders across the line in principle in supporting it. Um, and then we went to we went to launch on 10th of March. So 
from decision to pursue restructuring plan, it was you know, sort of eight weeks to to get the shareholders and banks across the line, and then um, and then sort of put everything in place to be able to launch. And then thirteenth of May, we um, the plan was sanctioned. Or um, oh, sorry, twelfth of May it was sanctioned. Thirteenth of May became effective. Um, so it's yeah, relatively. Amo would tell you that who acted for for us would tell you that that was quick, but yeah, it didn't. It felt like a very long time um, doing it, but it was. Um, we weren't quite starting from scratch either, as we've been sort of looking at our options over the last couple of months. And when did you need the um, if if sanction was going to be given by the court? When did you need it to be given by? What what outside date were you working towards? Well, we, the, the, we were working towards the week of tenth of May as the outside date. So on our on our cash forecasts, we were um, yeah we were out of we were out of cash um, the following week or, or the week after. It was in the nick of time then. Yeah, it was in the nick of time, and actually, um, uh, Justice Snowden was. You know, it was very sort of accommodating and focused on that. We we worried that we didn't have, you know, enough time for the process, and that he wouldn't be happy with the timetable from launch to convening hearings, for example. But he actually said, "Well, I can do them earlier if you, you know, if you want." He 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 managed to bring the timetable in a little bit for us on on the convening hearings. Um, we accepted that we wouldn't be able to really expect creditors to argue class issues fully at convening so we would have to allow those issues to be argued at sanction as well. Um, so, so to make the process work effectively the court has to be fully engaged on actively case managing the process yeah. so that you don't effectively lose a potential remedy before the court's been able to adjudicate on it. Exactly. Just, but also it's a question about disclosure, isn't there, James? I mean, there's a the speed also. There are arguments about whether or not the creditors are given enough opportunity to really understand the plan. Yes, um, that, that is true as well. So, yeah. I mean, there's a huge amount of information provided in the, um, the explanatory statement that was issued uh, ahead of the, you know, after um, 10th of March and the, the launch via practice statement letter, which is in itself a sort of reasonably substantial document and then a you know, very detailed explanatory statement with a lot of information um, in it that, um, yeah, nonetheless, the representative creditors wanted more information and um, yeah, made, made applications for, or argued for more information to be provided, which was you know, by and large was, or at least you know, large amounts of it, it was. So I think we had a, a versus a CBA, I think you'd say that you know, it was a, a, a vast amount of disclosure relative to a, to a CBA, for example, um, is my understanding mm -hmm. what's on a CBA, but, but that, I, am, I am told. Yeah. Tim, um, you're, um, I, I think those are one of the, certainly disclosure has been issues argued in recent times in the CBA cases. Um, after, um, well, we'll see what happens in your new look, but certainly after the first instance decision in New York and Regis, what, what, what sort of arguments do you think are still available to, uh, to landlords particularly in making the challenge? Well, I, I think the headline um, to take from these cases is, is that um, the landlord's arguments have, have all failed, really. Um, there, was, there, was, there was one ground which, which was upheld in, in, in Regis, but, but, but the, all of the, the challenges of principle have all failed. Um, mm. and, and I think what landlords are left with is um, really looking at the detail of proposals to, to um, uh, identify specific unfairness, unfairnesses that are specific to that scheme, the way that it's uh, intended to work, the way that it is um, uh, uh, voted for and approved. That, that, that are unfair in those particular circumstances. So things, things that um, um, aren't going to give grounds of challenge. I mean, it's, it, it's clear from the New Look case that, that a landlord's only type C, CVA is properly a CVA within mm -hmm. the meaning of the act. Um, uh, in that case, there was sufficient give and take um, for it to be an arrangement properly so-called. Um, there's nothing wrong with completely substituting the payment mechanism in the leases. So um, what we saw in, the, in that case was a switch to turnover rents. Um, there's nothing inherently unfair about that. Um, 
and um, uh, there were keep open obligations which were released. Um, and so, so you, you, you can see that all of the, all of the challenges that essentially say this isn't the type of thing that CVAs are for have failed. Mm -hmm. And so really it's going to be a matter of looking at the detail of uh, the arrangements proposed to, to see if it can be argued that they are unfairly prejudicial against the landlords. And in particular, looking at the process of getting to approval. Um, and, and one of the things that, that, that was argued um, uh, in, in New Look was the, the landlords took objection to the fairly standard discount given to the voting rights of the of the landlords um, as regards future rent and you can see why uh, um, but uh, uh, the court held that there was nothing inherently objectionable with with that um, so so that is a ground of challenges is gone. So you're left really looking at whether the overall picture is one of unfairness, where you've got un, uh, unaffected creditors or minimally affected creditors who are voting through an arrangement that, that achieves its goals at the expense of the poor old landlords. And um, on, on that, Tim, isn't it? Yeah. It's right, isn't it? That I think um, Mr. Justice Zaccarelli provided some clarification, um, I can put it like that, of um, of Mr. Justice Norris's earlier decision in the Debenhams case regarding market rents and unfair prejudice. Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, um, it, it, there's there's no rule that that if if substituted rent is below market rent, it's necessarily unfair. I mean, it, it all comes back to looking at the overall picture, and. Um, uh, how it how it should be characterized taking everything into account so it's a it's a different type of process to just saying look this 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 is um all of the other creditors getting a free lunch at the expense of the landlords it's it's going to be a matter of picking through the detail um but the overall t message is that um challenges by landlords have not been successful so far um and uh, are likely to be difficult in the future so, so it's a positive for retailers and a negative for landlords. You mentioned, Tim, I think the, the one ground that was successful in Regis, and that I think was to do with the, um, the unfairly favoured position of the sole member of the company. Uh, it, it strikes me that I think what's been called the restructuring excess in a slightly different context is, is an issue for the process, both in VA and in restructuring, and that essentially mm. shareholders get to keep the benefit of the business um, but the compromised creditors never see any upside, which is realised once the, the business is back on its feet. H how, how at all do you think that ought to be perhaps looked at again? I mean, the obvious answer to that is to put it in the legislation. But how does that feed in, do you think, maybe to the more discretionary issues? It was clearly something argued in, in Virgin Active, but didn't cut any uh, ice um, with the judge. Um, maybe, James, first of all, you, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, you know... In our situation, it was, um, uh, and on, on, the, on the judgment that we had the, and the facts that we had the, yeah, there wasn't really, um, th that there's a sort of restructuring excess was a, you know, was a question and was a line of argument, um, definitely yeah. for the, for the landlord um, creditor grouping and why, why couldn't they participate? Why would, weren't they participating in, in that? I mean, I think the, um, what the judge was quite clear about was that you had to look at the circumstances that you were in at the point in time that the um, the court was being asked to decide on on sanction or, or not, and what the alternative was if it didn't um, sanction. And in our case, the alternative to sanction was uh, a trading administration in which mm. the we thought that um, apart from the class A landlords, none of the other landlords would um, you know would would end up with a recovery of any of their arrears um, mm. and they would probably you know at, at best in class b you'd probably you know if you were lucky you might find another tenant who would pay the same rent going forward but our properties um were sort of relative to market over rented so you know the likelihood was that a new tenant was going to actually pay less less rent going forwards and you know wouldn't be you know why, why would they pay the pay the arrears um so as it turned out for us, there wasn't a, there wasn't a kind of yeah all of the um, unsecured creditors 
other than the Class A landlords were were out of the money um, in the alternative. So they didn't really have any standing. Was Snowden's um, decision in terms of you know how the future looked because yeah you know, they had no they had no stake in the future looking looking at it currently. I mean I think our uh, the the Deloitte restructuring partner who who sort of led for us a chap called Henry Nicholson <coughs> gave um, gave evidence on on this point and was is quoted in the in, in the judgment sort of fairly extensively but his view and his view of restructuring generally was that um you know in our case the shareholders were putting in new you know genuinely new mm. money um mm. in order to fund the opportunity to uh, run the restructuring plan and then you know further money um what if the restructuring plan was was sanctioned um the landlords uh, and other unsecured creditors were not, you know, they weren't, they weren't putting in any new money. Yes, they had, uh, you know, existing contractual obligations or, you know, contractual um, rights that were going to be uh, writ written off or written down. Um, but that was, in the view of um, sort of restructuring world, the value of the new money, which was necessary to facilitate the process, was, you know, was not comparable to the value of a, of a, of a write down. Um, of uh, an existing contractual liability, which in the alternative to the restructuring plan, you know, we, you'd, you'd never see that money, it's lost money um, uh, versus you know, new money that is, you know, if the shareholders didn't put it in, they weren't going to lose it. Um, so in that, in that context, I think, you know, and perhaps I would say this, but from a, you know, from a company or from an equity point of view, um, it's difficult to see why, you know, why, why, why should a, an unsecured creditor who who doesn't have a currently in the money position, you know, get an upside um, from a restructuring um, that they're not, um, you know, they're not putting any new money at risk in. Um, I mean, ultimately, the landlords uh, where compromised could vote with their feet and take their, it could obviously vote against, but they could also take their property back and um, find a different tenant and, um, uh, and, and, you know, you know, recover recover value in in that way. If that's you know, if they saw that was a better option for them than the mm. restructuring. I mean, that's hard. Like, familiar, that's familiar. That's hard lines though for a landlord, isn't it? If the argument is well, you can just take your premises back and find a new tenant. I mean, <laughs> yeah. there are obviously market considerations, but Absolutely. also there are significant voids that may be incurred. Yes. Uh, is that really a genuine upside? I, I well, um, I suppose it, it, it predominantly depends on whose side you're looking at it for and um but yeah. I mean, it, 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 in essence it's all a balancing exercise isn't it but i i do think that um what that that whilst one can i mean on on a on a, on a generalized level say that you know, the hospitality sector has been very very badly affected um by covid um one can categorize landlords negatively but if they're going to have to take a property back in the well in in any environment but particularly the current environment there's there's significant potential losses going forward until they can mm. find a, a suitable new tenant yeah. yeah i think that's all true and i would also sort of add that you know from an upside perspective i think the you know the the evidence of our um you know, property agent which was un was unchallenged by the you know the, the institutional landlords who were who were kind of backing the um, backing the opposition to the restructuring plan, um, their view on the ERV of our properties was that you know they were predominantly sort of over rented. So by returning to um, by returning as we you know will be to contractual rent in our in our um, clubs after concession periods, yeah, you know, there's a, you, you can argue that there's an upside for for landlords there. They're getting an over market rent. Through to the end of our leases, that um, you know, if they were reletting, they wouldn't be they wouldn't be getting that um, that level of rent. Um, and, and yet, there's still a sense, isn't there, in which it feels unfair to landlords. Uh, and I think perhaps part of the issue is the way in which some landlords do fine, uh, and others end up with very very substantial haircuts. And that's achieved essentially on a, a, a mechanical analysis of over-renting, under-renting, the relevant alternative. And one can absolutely justify it. But 
relatively small proportionate changes in the in whether you're over or under rented can result in enormous differences as to whether you get 100 pence in the pound or 20 pence in the pound and i i do wonder whether over time that just that sense of unfairness is going to need to be addressed by some sort of adjustment to the system uh, not least because i think otherwise over time even those landlords substantial landlords who might do perfectly fine out of any given plan may end up opposing it quite vigorously for fear of the next plan in which they'll be in a lower class and, and suffer accordingly. Mm. Yeah. James, on just on the pro, just, just perhaps on the process, um, one issue that uh, I think the judge, although the, the landlords made a lot of it, the, the, the judge was fairly dismissive of the challenge to the valuation evidence that you put forward, term, particularly in terms of the relevant alternative, which is you, as you've confirmed, is the, was the trading admin. I mean, in this process, I don't know how, how many days of cross-examination was taken up with it, but I know the valuers were pretty pushed pretty hard. And in the end, the judge didn't really think very much of that line of attack. No, I, I think that's 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 right. Um, and I think that's a, it's a kind of a watch out on who your sort of who your witnesses are. But also it's um, from a from a, cr a creditor perspective it's quite it's quite hard to get under the skin of you know a given business and to put forward I would think evidence that is sort of compelling and opposing to you know the company's own and the company's advisor's own evidence um, on valuation um, with the benefit of this you know proximity and knowledge of the business so um, we had Grant Thornton uh, carried out a valuation and I, mean, I think the nature of, I mean, the head of valuation was the, you know, was the witness and was, you know, cross-examined pretty extensively, as you, as you said, um, and really, in a, I think it's a question of almost helping the court because I think I don't think Snowden had a lot of choice really because we we've got you know credible proper pucker you know head of valuation witness giving uh, a report and um, witness evidence under cross-examination and then we had you know we had. Um, advisors to the landlord groups um, sort of challenging challenging that in their witness evidence and also cross-examination from um, from uh, from legal counsel for for the <coughs> laws but they didn't whilst they challenged it and um, sort of contested and argued and sort of pointed out shortcomings with you know limitations in reports queried whether you know different comparables should have been looked at and mm -hmm. the rest of it um, they didn't actually put forward any positive valuation uh, evidence in the alternative which so I think in that it didn't really give the judge very many options he could either say well you know I'm, I'm basically not regarding this as a valuation because you know because of all these shortcomings that are being pointed out to me um he he, he couldn't say I, I prefer your evidence on valuation because that you know it really wasn't alternative valuation evidence so I think um I mean one of the things from our judgment I think is that the yeah that the, the for all of the arguments around you know, sort of fairness and um, you know shareholder contribution and um, process and disclosure, all of those those areas, um, it really came down to very hard um, sort of factual tests on what was the value, yeah, you know, what was which valuation evidence should be um, you know kind of accepted or or preferred, and and what is the relevant alternative in this situation what what genuinely or what's the best um the best guess at what the most likely thing to happen mm. is if the restructuring plan doesn't go ahead so i think from a landlord or creditor perspective you you know you going forward there will be a huge amount of focus on how how do you challenge and put forward alternative evidence on those points because you probably you know you, you need to, to to be able to to succeed to, to, to which the answer is with enormous difficulty, as you say, because um, the plan company has the information. Uh, as you, you'll recall that the landlords fought very hard indeed in Virgin to get more access to information. And, and you're right, they had substantial success. Um, but nevertheless, you might think there was a, a necessary inequality of arms in terms of, your, you know, your, your you're the business, you know best what's going on. Um, I, I must say, I think one of the areas in which this might be ripe for a bit of reform is 
we should have some better clarity about what material the creditors should be given access to uh, mm. in order to formulate their own proposals and, 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 and challenge the plan or at least stress test the plan. Because one of the practical problems you have is that, at least in the Virgin case, you had a, a hotly contested um, convening hearing, a substantial quantity of which was taken up with debate about information access. And, and of course, by the time you've resolved that, and then whatever further information might be provided, you're working to an immensely compressed timetable. And so it's it's not just lack of information from the landlord's perspective, it's also time. And so I do wonder whether if there was greater clarity at the stage of formulating the plan, you know, in advance of the convening hearing as to what the creditors should get. I mean, it, firstly, it might avoid a great deal of debate at the convening hearing. Uh, and secondly, uh, might make it uh, it might actually genuinely as well as make it easier for creditors to challenge the plan it might reduce an element of suspicion and hostility uh, because people may feel more engaged i think there's truth in that um i think it's um you know i see the sort of, the sort of question in on 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 whether challengers have all of the information that they uh, that they need to enable them to to sort of put forward a proper challenge but the you know i think in the it, on the equality of arms case, actually, when you when you're looking at the um, relevant alternative um, assessment, I think you know that I don't think that advisors for creditors are necessarily in a worse position to form a compelling view for the court as to what's the most likely thing to happen to a business like this in this situation if this restructuring plan isn't um, isn't approved. So yeah, I think on, on that front, I don't see that. You know, in our case, PwC were particularly at a disadvantage versus, you know, Deloitte or any other, you know, any other um, sort of seasoned restructuring um, outfit who could, you know, put forward a compelling view on on relevant alternatives. Also, the in our case on the um, sort of information for landlords. I mean, one of the um, Snowden picked up on this um, was that while. The landlords were complaining about sort of an inequality of information or lack of information. How can we make an assessment? They, you know, they didn't, for example, challenge the um, uh, estimated rental values of the properties that were put forward by our by our property expert. Um, and there, you know, there's no reason that you, you would say that British land, for example, you know, it, it is better placed to put forward views of ERV on their properties than you know, than we are. Um, or our advisors are, uh, and they, you know, they've got a view of the whole property market, um, and you know, very, very well positioned to form views on ERV because that's their that's their day job. But the, you know, for example, that you know that there's not an inequality of arms there, and it was you know we we thought telling that they didn't put forward any evidence on that on that front in our in our case. Um, the difficult part for a landlord or any other creditor is the. Um, you know, it's perhaps the you know the trading position of the business or the prospects of the business going forwards, but and the you know and valuation, but valuation is you know valuation is inherently subjective. It's uh you know it's a in the same way that business forecasts are subjective. It's you know it and it came out in the in the um, cross examinations and the and the sort of lines of argument that you can only really tell what you can only really tell what the business is, is worth now if someone actually buys it now. Um, and, you know, short of that, you know, it's, <laughs> it's speculation to of a more, more or less informed nature. So, there's, yes. yeah, it, I don't know, it's hard. I mean, there's a vast amount of information provided in, in our case, uh, but I think it would definitely be beneficial to the process going forward if there was a you know, kind of standardized or some sort of, you know, more, more kind of, a, uh, there becomes a sort of an accepted practice around what, what is uh, appropriate level of information disclosure and, and when. But I mean, uh, talking about a vast amount of information, your 99 page judgment in uh, City World and Mecca, um, as I, I, I mentioned at the beginning also the TFS case, what arguments do you think are left after the, the, the judgment of the two masters in those, in those cases? Well, um, uh, yes, you're right to point out the um, the, the length of the of the judgment of Master Dagnall, 100 or 101 pages, on a summary judgment application. Although to be fair to him, it was summary judgment applications in four separate claims, but all raising similar or identical issues. 
and heard over four days at the back end of last year. Well, the answer to your question is, I think very much, I mean, depending on the particular case, the arguments based on the interpretation of the rent cessor provisions, particularly or especially where there is uh, um, insurance in place, which covers um, the pandemic, are there to play for. I mean, Master Dagnall in our case, which Tim and I were involved in, decided those issues against us. Um, but I mean, as is often the way with, with, with uh, points of construction, there are reasonable arguments to be made on both sides. And if you look at over the years at the leading construction cases, it's very much not uncommon for the result to change at the different, different appellate levels that the case reaches. Uh, in, in our, just to get to a bit more to specifics in our case, in our rent cessor provision, I mean, the key, the focus of the argument was on the correct interpretation of, uh, of um, uh, destroyed or damaged by in, uh, an insured risk. And Master Dagnall's decision, in essence, was that the reference to damaged or damage could only refer and did only refer to physical damage, and it couldn't uh, attach to uh, non-physical or, or economic damage. Um, I have to say, I think that was quite a literalist approach to interpretation, because the um, in definition of insured risk, risks, which is obviously integral to the interpretation of, of the actual rent cessor provision, contained elements where it was clearly um, a very probable, if not almost a certainty, that the, uh, the, the sort of torrential drafting that you experience in definition clauses, there were elements of the, de of the definition of insured risk, of strikes uh, and labour disputes, where it, the only damage you could reasonably contemplate because of the presence of other elements which dealt with you know, lobbing bricks through windows and that sort of thing was non-physical or economic damage, but he wasn't impressed by that at all. Um, so, I mean, our, our essential point was because the landlord had taken out insurance and of course the tenant had to pay for it, which did cover the pandemic and the landlord conceded in the hearing that that was sufficient to account to, to, to be an insured risk or fall within the definition of an insured risk. Um, there was this disconnect, massive disconnect between the insurance provision and the definition of insured risks on the one hand, and what the and the potency of the rent cessor provision on the other, and he didn't really, I, I, in in my view, um, sufficiently address that. So, I think it is all up up, up for grabs still. Um, uh, obviously, it will need it on this case to um, to go to appeal and with, which. It's being considered, so I can't really take matters that say much more about that at the moment. But certainly in, in, in other cases where you've got applicable insurance and a, um, a, a suitable rent cessor provision, it's still there to play for. Mm. Yeah. Um, in our last five minutes, um, Tim, just in light of your involvement in that case and looking at more generally the, the landscape in the next nine months and in view of the extended moratorium what, what do you think the issues that we might be arguing about uh, both during that period and if the cliff edge occurs in March thereafter well it, it all depends on what happens in the next nine months I think I mean um, the the um, uh, question of liability for rent during lockdown has obviously been an issue um, mm. over, over the last year or so um, whether that continues to be an issue will depend on probably two things. First of all, whether we have more lockdowns, um, but also on how businesses are recovering from, from the disruption of the last year and whether they're, they're able to come to accommodations <coughs> with their landlords. Um, mm -hmm. 
So, uh, um, what about this arbitration? What about the arbitration proposal? Have you have you got much into the detail of that? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe not. We, we don't know. Well, there was only was, was it the chief secretary you know, of the yes, Treasury sorry. in the Commons mentioned or sort of mumbled about um, an Australian scheme. I've done a bit of delving about that, and they do have yeah. a, um, a a rent relief scheme in Australia, where the um, uh, the, co the, the the COVID shutdown arrears um, are treated separately to um, other arrears, um, and the um, the I think that the, the, the position is um, that there are there is a scheme whereby there are percentage reductions depending on the impact on the business percentage reductions which the landlords have to swallow for those ring fenced covid arrears um, but i mean obviously the detail is going to um, come out in the presumably in the legislation that's been foreshadowed in in, in yeah, due I mean, course i mean, I mean I it's pretty clear it, isn't it sorry go on i don't, don't think anyone was surprised by um, the fact that the that there was an extension, but I think it's a bit of a gulp um, uh, when it was realised that it was going to take us to a, a second anniversary of mm. uh, of this uh, of the moratoria, certainly for for um, eviction proceedings and CRA. Um, but it, it, it's it's going to remain to be seen. I mean, I think the the, the problem I mean, the, the government called for evidence, and a lot of a, a lot of evidence was given. Um, uh, as part of that exercise, which presumably is what has at least influenced what's what's come out what's come out now, but I, I think the problem with the early days of lockdown was that the, the code that um, uh, was published was voluntary, and so mm. I mean I always thought it was a, almost nothing more than a than a than a, a command to play nice children, play nice play yeah. nicely children. I mean it had no teeth at all, really. And so those who were going to come to a, 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 an acceptable solution would do so. But the recalcitrance on, on both sides, I don't exclude um, uh, tenants gaming the system here, the um, recalcitrance on both sides, it just doesn't do anything. It doesn't serve any, any purpose, in my view. Yeah. I mean, I James, how, how, uh, you're, yeah, go on. I was just going to say, I agree from my experience that the, yeah, the code was, was you know, broadly irrelevant. Yeah. Um, we were able to reach compromises with um, some landlords through, you know, extending leases and you know getting some rent-free concessions, that kind of thing in that way. But um, but a, but apart from that, it you know it, it it was certainly nothing. You know, we certainly didn't go into bat saying, you know, expecting people to um, sort of abide by the terms of the of the code. So I think something that has some teeth is is necessary. Um, to force a force a compromise, otherwise, you know, I think it'll, you know, there'll be, as you say, people on both sides who are not prepared to compromise, and um, we won't be out of uh, out of the woods. I mean, it is also, I think, the moratorium. We wouldn't have been able to launch our restructuring plan without the moratorium um, having been extended and extended and extended. Um, you know, we we would have been in to administration or you know some, something else in 2020. Um, if if that moratorium hadn't been there, and that will be true, you know, now still of many businesses um, who will be depending on um, the ability to 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 reach a compromise on their on their arrears. Otherwise, they you know they you know, they, they simply won't be able to afford to pay the arrears. I mean, just it's not possible. So, um, yeah, it it it's it's still to be determined, really. I think how it how this pans out. James, there seems to be this almost uh, automatic assumption that, I mean, whilst there might be a level of understanding that if you're in the retail sector, the, the hospitality sector, when you're shut down and so you've got no income, you've got no, no um, income with which to pay, to pay the rent, if that's your, your, what you're relying on for that. Once um, there is unlocked down, it's almost um, assumed that, well, then there can be no excuse why you can't pay rent now but surely it takes a little bit of time for the trickle of returning clients customers uh, uh, to uh, and also the restrictions that you have to work under continuing restrictions 
for, for, for you to get up to speed, so to speak, in, in terms of, uh, of gathering the income with which to pay the rent, even though you're open? Well, definitely. I mean, in our case, we've lost, um, you know, we've lost getting on for, well, we had no paying members, obviously, while we were, were closed. But on, on reopening, we're, you know, we'd, we'd lost getting on for half of our paying membership. And we weren't expecting to rebuild that to pre-pandemic levels until 2024, 2025. So, um, you know, that, that we're a subscription business, you know, where you, know, you pay a monthly membership and, um, you know, losing people is, um, it, it, yeah, it, it's not just like someone, you know, who can sort of come back into the shop tomorrow and, you know, buy that television or whatever it was that they hadn't bought during lockdown when you were shut because they couldn't. There's no, um, we get no, uh, there's no boost. There's no sort of, you know, lockdown easing sort of boon in terms of return of revenue and the same will be so I think retail is perhaps a little less effective and they've got other channels through which they can um they can sell but obviously significantly affected um and people can you know spend the spend the money that they haven't um, during lockdown um hospitality as you say under the restrictions they're under I mean you know every every day on the news you, you see somebody from UK hospitality or that sector saying how you know, yes, they're open, but but they're but they're losing money. Um, and then you know, leisure and um, businesses like ours, uh, you know, kind of another longer term. It's a longer term rebuild, def definitely. Well, James, that's that's the final word to you, as is probably appropriate. I I'm very grateful to you for spending an hour with us, picking through some of these problems, as I am grateful to uh, my, the other three panelists for um, their insights. Um, it's been extremely illuminating to hear from the coalface um, of one of um, the hospitality sector's important occupiers or very important occupiers. So that's uh, been um, incredibly helpful. Uh, to the rest of um, you watching or listening, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. Please do look out for our next webinar, which we hope will be um, within the next six weeks or so. Uh, but with that, um, thank you very much for your attention. Goodbye. <laughs>